In this video, we are going to prove the titular topic for lecture 20 here, which is the so-called uh, lemma of Gauss, Gauss's lemma. Now, before we present Gauss's lemma, there's a definition that's important to bring up in this situation. Suppose D is an integral domain, and we have some polynomial f of x over uh, this integral domain. So f of x looks like a sub n times x to the n plus a n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1, all the way down to like some a2x squared plus a1x plus a0. And all of these a's, all these coefficients come from our domain d like so. So then we define the content of our polynomial f as the GCD of the coefficients a0, a1, a2, a3, all up to a n. Um, and we say that a polynomial is primitive if this GCD is equal to one, okay? Now, admittedly, we have talked about beforehand how GCDs might not even exist in all integral domains. So this content might be undefined for certain polynomials, but in the setting, of course, of a unique factorization domain, GCDs, arbitrary GCDs do exist. So therefore every polynomial has a well-defined content. And of course, the notion of a primitive polynomial makes sense always, uh, because if the GCD is equal to one, we call it primitive. So that's why that's the setting for which Gauss's lemma is gonna take place in. Uh, suppose that D is a unique factorization domain. So in particular, GCDs always exist and every polynomial has a well-defined content. Again, it could be one, a primitive polynomial. We like primitive polynomials. Uh, take two polyno polynomials, F and G, that belong to this ring D adjoined X. Then the content of their product, the content of F times G, is going to equal the content of F times the content of G. So it turns out that over a unique factorization domain, this content function is multiplicative, uh, the product the content of the product is the product of the contents. We have this multiplicative property, which re is really, really nice. So in particular, if F and G are primitive polynomials, this then tells us that the product of two primitive polynomials is primitive. And so that's, that's what often is described as Gauss's lemma. The product of two primitive polynomials is primitive. But it's, it's true for general polynomials that the contents um, of the product is the product of the contents. Okay, and so let's take a look at this. And it turns out that we can actually push Gauss's lemma um, into the setting of being primitive very, very quickly here. So we have our two polynomials, f of x and g of x. Um, factor out their content, right? If, if c is the content of f here, that means every coefficient in f is divisible by c. You can factor it out. Um, and then everything that's left behind, all those coefficients where you factor away the t, uh, factor away the c, those numbers have to then be relatively prime because if there was more, if there was another common divisor beyond one, we could have factored that out as well. And that would have meant that c was not the greatest common divisor. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you have a polynomial that's imprimitive, you could factor out its content and then you're gonna get content times a primitive polynomial, which we're gonna call that f1. Uh, and so the same thing with g of x right here. If its, if its content is called d, factor it out, and then g is gonna equal its content d times g minus one sub polynomial, and that polynomial will be primitive. And it'll have the same degree as g. Same thing with f1 here. f1 will have the same degree as, as f because these contents are numbers from the domain d, and therefore there's zero degree polynomials. They're just, they're just coefficients in that situation. So F1 and G1 are gonna be primitive in this setting. And so when you look at the product F times G, this is gonna equal the product CD times F1 times G1. And since F1 and G1 are both primitive, um, it suffices to prove Gauss's lemma in the setting where the product of primitive polynomials is primitive. Uh, because if, since these polynomials are primitive, if that statement holds, then the content of F1 times G1 is going to be one, that the content there, and then times that by CD, the content of that situation would then be CD, which is then the product of the contents for F and G. So we're able to kick the can down the road and we can assume that F and G are primitive polynomials going forward here. That makes the argument a lot easier. So again, um, well, maybe not again, but let's, 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 
specify the coefficients of f here. So let's say that the coefficients of f will be denoted a sub i, where i then captures the power of x, it's the coefficient of, and the same scheme for g, we will call the uh, coefficients of g, uh, bi, or bj I should call it, um, where again j is the coefficient uh, the, the, the index of the coefficient bj is the exponent of x there. Um, let's suppose that f has degree n and g has degree m like so. Now, let's consider, so we're assuming, we're assuming f and g are primitive polynomials. What if f times g was imprimitive? That is, it's great, the greatest common divisor between the coefficients was something other than one? Well, there's got to be a prime divisor. So let p be a prime divisor dividing all of the coefficients of f times g. Now, because f and g, uh, well, well, let's just look at f for a moment. Since f is a primitive polynomial, p cannot divide all of the coefficients of f. In particular, there's got to be a smallest, a smallest index where a smallest integer, again, with regard to the subscripts here, there's some smallest number r such that p doesn't divide a r. Because again, if there wasn't, that is, if p divided everything, then f would be imprimitive, which by assumption it's not. Similarly for g, since g is primitive, there's at least one coefficient of g that's not divisible by this prime number p, and so choose s to be the smallest index where that happens. So we're assuming that p does not divide ar, and p does not divide b sub s there. And this follows from the primitivity of f and g. So now we're going to look at the coefficient of the monomial x to the r plus s in the product f of x times g of x. Where does that come from? Well, the coefficient of the coefficient of x to the r plus s power, let's call it c sub r plus s, it's going to be computed by the convolution product here. We're going to take the sums of all of the possible products, a i times b j, where the indices i plus i and j when they add together is equal to the quantity r plus s. So then if you look at all the possibilities, you could have a0 times b times r plus s, a1 times b r plus s minus 1. Um, going down here, you have a times r plus s minus 1 times b1. You'll have a r plus s times b0. And I confess that because of the degree of the polynomial, it might be that like r plus s is larger than one of the degrees. It could be larger than n or m or something like that. That's okay. Some of these coefficients could in fact be 0 in the product. It's not a problem by including them here. Um, in particular, the product a r times b s is going to be in that combination because clearly r plus s adds up to b r plus s. I mean, it's, it's in the name there. And so notice the assumptions we have here. Um, by assumption, we have p divides a0, a1, all the way up to a r minus 1. Because remember, a r was the first coefficient of f that wasn't divisible by p. Likewise, by assumption, p divides b0, b1, b2, all the way to b s minus 1. Because again, b s is the smallest coefficient of gs. I should say the first coefficient of gs that's not divisible by p. And so if you take all of these things here, so when you look at this one, oh, a0 is divisible by p, so is a1, all the way up to, all of the a's up to ar are going to be divisible by p. But from the other direction, b0 is divisible by p, b1 is divisible by, t, by p, and so all the way up, all of those coefficients b's except for bs there are going to be divisible by p. So everything here, this is a sum of products, which each of those a's is divisible by p, and over here is a sum of products where each of the corresponding b's are divisible by p. So if you put all of those things together, that sum is divisible by p. Okay, and then by assumption, we also have that C R plus S is divisible by P because P is a prime divisor of the content of, of F times G. So it divides all of the coefficients. So if we move this sum to the other side of the equation, clean this up a little bit, we're going to have C R plus S minus each and every one of these. Well, actually, let, let, let me make it a little bit simple. We're going to move this one to the other side like so. Um, because each and every one of these things is divisible by p, um, you're going to have that c r plus s minus a r b s is divisible by p. But then there again, c r plus s is divisible by p by assumption. So then this eventually gets us to the conclusion that p divides a r times b s. But wait a second, 
uh, P is a prime number, so Euclid's lemma applies. Um, and by, by prime number, I don't necessarily mean it's like an integer. It's it's a prime in the field. And, um, you know, I say by Euclid's lemma, but honestly speaking here, Euclid's lemma is taken as the definition of a prime number. Uh I guess I didn't did I say a field a moment ago. D is a unique factorization domain here. Um, we do have these prime elements. Prime and irreducible elements are exactly the same thing, but prime elements are defined by this Euclid's lemma property here. So the only way that a prime element could divide a product is that P divides AR or P divides BS. That's the only thing that can happen. But by construction, uh, I should say by selection of AR and BS, that doesn't happen. We get a contradiction. And what was the contradiction? The contradiction was that um, the, the polynomial f of x times g of x, its content had a prime divisor. There is a prime that divides all of the coefficients of, of f times g. We don't have that. That's a contradiction. So there is no prime divisor of the content of f times g. Now, the coefficients of f times g, like all the polynomials here, they come from a unique factorization domain d. This is a unique factorization domain. Um, therefore, each of those coefficients has prime divisors. We have unique factorization. So what that means is our content has to be a unit. It's a unit for this polynomial, which that then tells us that the GCD is equal to one. Uh, and therefore, f of x is a primitive polynomial. So that gives us then the proof of Gauss's lemma. Now, there's a very important corollary to Gauss's lemma. And honestly, this is how we are going to think of Gauss's lemma in this lecture series, this corollary right here. So let D be a unique factorization domain. Therefore, the Gauss le Gauss's lemma we saw in the previous slide will apply. And let F be the field of fractions uh, over that domain D. Let f be a polynomial in D adjoin x. So this is a polynomial whose coefficients come from the UFD. If there exist polynomials, which call them alpha and beta in F adjoin x, so alpha and beta have coefficients coming from the field of fractions. Um, if there's polynomials F and beta, uh, alpha beta, such that F of x factors as alpha x times beta x, then there necessarily exists polynomials A and B um, over D adjoin x, such that the degree of alpha is equal to the degree of A and the degree of beta is equal to the degree of B. And we have that F of X equals A adjoin X and B adjoin X. All right. So before proving this statement, I want to kind of explain what's going on here. Uh, so Gauss's lemma and its corollary um, that we're going to see here on the screen, um, they're going to tell us, and you might have to use a little bit of an induction argument here as well, but Gauss's lemma plus its corollary says that if a polynomial factors over a field, then we have essentially the same factorization over the corresponding integral domain, or I should say over the corresponding unique factorization domain. Um, that is both factorizations when considered factorizations in F adjoined x here because after all alpha and beta are in f adjoin x but a and b are in d adjoin x but d adjoin x is a sub is a sub ring of f adjoin x so these are two factorizations in f adjoin x uh which i should which basically f adjoin x here is a unique factorization domain um therefore there's only one factorization up to up to uniqueness, of course. And so with regard to F adjoin X, these are essentially the same factorization. They're equivalent factorizations. But in particular, this factorization is in fact a D factorization as opposed to the previous one, which is a uh, F factorization. So over F adjoin X, it doesn't care. These are the same factorizations. We have a unique factorization domain, but every F factorization can be turned into a D factorization. So factoring polynomials over a unique factorization domain is equivalent to factoring it over um, its field of fractions. And so essentially it doesn't matter which setting you're in when it comes to factoring, um, whether you're over the field of fractions or a unique factorization domain. And so what this gives us, what this empowers us to do is things like the remainder theorem, the factor theorem, the number of roots theorem, uh, those are theorems which we proved over a field, a field F. Well, if we take some sub, some sub ring of F, um, it's necessarily going to be, of course, a, 
um, a domain. Um, if we take some subfield, uh, excuse me, some subdomain of f such that f is still the field of fractions here, because if you take it too small, right, like the integers inside of the complex numbers here, uh, well, this is a field, this is a domain, but the field of fractions is not c. It would be um, the rational numbers in that situation. Um, if you have a domain whose field of fractions is given as f, the factorizations are the same. And therefore, things like the factor theorem can be pushed from the rationals into the integers. Um, the remainder theorem, uh, the number of roots theorems, and some other things they will talk about in the future. It really doesn't matter whether we're talking about the field or the unique factorization domain because of this consequence right here, Gauss's lemma. The factorization, um, the factorization, over the unique factorization domain is the same as the factorization of the field with regard to the polynomials. If you take, for example, the factor theorem that says the roots co coincide with each other, right? The That is, uh, roots of a polynomial correspond with linear factors. We prove that for fields, but if we have a factorization over the field with a linear factor, we get a root there, then we can push that into a factorization over um, over the domain. And so therefore, the factor theorem can be carried over in that setting as well. For example, take the polynomial f of x equals, we're going to take a doozy here, x to the fifth uh, plus 5x to the fourth minus 8x cubed uh, minus 14x squared plus 6x plus 9. Take this polynomial as an example. I claim that one of the roots of this polynomial is going to be three halves. So it has a root. Now, this is a, you can think of this as an integer polynomial. Its roots might be in a larger ring, um, like three halves, but we still have a factorization uh, of the polynomial. Because, because by the factor theorem, if we look at the field of fractions of the integers, which is the rational numbers, yeah, you're gonna have you have a root. A rational root three halves that'll then give us a uh, that'll give us a linear factor over the rational numbers. What would that look like? Well, I can use synthetic division to ascertain that. So by synthetic division, let's just do this one real quick. You're gonna have two, five, negative eight, negative fourteen, six, and nine. We are gonna divide by the number three halves, like so. We're testing for a root. Bring down the two. You get 3 halves times 2, which is 3, plus 5, which is 8, times 3 halves is going to give you 12, minus 8, which is equal to 4, times 3 halves, which is equal to 6. Negative 14 plus 6 is then going to give us a negative 8. Uh, 3 halves times negative 8 is going to give us a negative 12, like so. Negative 12 plus 6 is then going to give us a negative 6. Uh, 3 halves times negative 6 is going to give us a negative 9, which adds up to be 0. So we didn't find, we did in fact find a root. And so this root then gives us a factorization. So our polynomial f of x factors as x minus 3 halves times, we're going to get 2x to the fourth plus 8x cubed plus 4x squared minus 8x minus 6, like so. This is a factorization over the rational numbers. But I want you to notice here that this polynomial, its content is two, I'll, if you view it as an integer polynomial, of course. Um, you have two, eight, four, negative eight, negative six. These are all even numbers. We can factor out a two. Um, and so when you factor out that two, you have this factor of two that's now you could put in front of the polynomial, which then you could redistribute here to clear the denominators. You also get the factorization of two X minus three times X to the fourth plus 4x cubed, plus 2x squared, minus 4x, minus 3. Sorry, kind of crowded there. And so we all to turn a factorization of the rational numbers into a factorization of the integers. And the beauty of Gauss's lemma is this always happens if you are factoring polynomials over a unique factorization domain. So let's then see the details of this very argument here. Okay, so let me scooch back up just a little bit so we can see our two statements here. So we have a factorization over f, f equals alpha times beta, and we have a factorization over d where f equals a times b, like so. So as alpha and beta are polynomials over the field of fractions, 
Um, if we look at basically the least common multiple between all of the fractions in alpha, let's call that least common multiple, you know, the least common denominator C, you could times alpha by C, which C would be a number in D, um, which in, since it's unique factorization domain, least common multiples do exist in that situation. Um, then that gives us that C times alpha will be a, will be a polynomial in the ring DX. If we do the same thing for, for beta here, we could look at the least common denominator D, and we times everything in that by D, this will give you D beta is a polynomial in DX, like so. And so, because of that, we're then going to, well, consider the following, take C alpha X to equal C1 um, AX, and then you have D beta X is equal to D1 BX, okay? Um, so just so you're aware, in this situation, we are given alpha, beta. We don't have a, b. We have to construct what the polynomials a, b, are. And that's what we're trying to do right here. So you have the polynomial c, alpha, x. You have the polynomial d, beta, x. These belong to d adjoined x. Um, and so then factor out their content. So let's say the content of c alpha is c1 and the content of d beta is d1. That then gives us primitive polynomials a and b, which will also belong to the ring D adjoin X. In particular, uh, the primitive polynomials A and B will have the same degrees as alpha and beta uh, respectively. So if I take the polynomial CD times F of X, this would then be the same thing as C alpha times D beta, which then is C one A times D one B, uh, for which then by Gauss's lemma, the content of this product is C1 D1, and therefore C1 D1 is the content of CD, which admittedly, since you took F of X and times it by CD, the content of CDF is gonna be CD times whatever the content of F was. Uh, in particular, um, CD is going to divide C1 D1. So there's some number E inside of our domain D such that CDE is equal to C1 D1 like so. All right, uh, for which then, if you cancel CD from, from both sides of this equation right here, because uh, we can write this as C1, uh, excuse me, uh, no, that, that was the right direction. We, want, we can rewrite C1, D1 as CDE, um, A of X times B of X, like so. Um, DX is an integral domain, so the CDs cancel, and we end up with F of X equals E times AX times BX here. So uh, this then gives us a factorization. Since AX belongs to DX, E times AX is going to belong to DX, and you have B right here. So we might have this factor of E in play here, but in particular, the factorization over the field of fractions turned into a factorization over the unique factorization domain D. And so this is a very powerful result known as Gauss's lemma. And this is where, of course, we're going to end our lecture. Thanks for watching. If you learned anything about factorization of polynomials over arbitrary unique factorization domains and fields, uh, like these videos, please. Uh, subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future. And post any questions in the comments below if you have any. I'll be glad to answer them.